I graduated uh, in 2011 from architecture uh, in Delft, and um, I also got a job as an architect. Uh, I worked in a Shanghaiese office, uh, and it was an amazing job. I was 20 years old and had the ability to design skyscrapers of 220 meters tall with, uh, with fellow colleagues. I, could make, I, I was part of a design team for making luxury hotels, for real estate, uh, towers, anything you can imagine that you dream of doing as an architect, especially with the age of 22, I could do there. Uh, but still, even though my boss took really good care of me and um, my colleagues were really great and good to hang out with, uh, after a few months, I, I started to feel more and more uh, weight and more and more, more uh, negative uh, about being in that environment, being in that office, going there from half past nine to seven, and sitting behind your desk and, and having an air conditioning and not, not a lot of ability to, to move. And I started to, um, to lose my creativity. I started to feel brain dead and I thought, okay, I either have a choice. I'm going to fulfill my one-year contract or I'm going to quit. And in the end, uh, after, after a few months, I thought, uh, after half a year, I thought, okay, this is not my, if this is what architecture is like, if, if you have to be in an office like this, I'm just not going to be an architect. I'm going to quit my job and uh, do a master in uh, design academy in Eindhoven. Um, a year ago, I started design research uh, and was basically pointing out uh, this, uh, this, this, this point, like how come we create a society where we have productive life and leisure time? And how come uh, we create this environment for our productive life, whereas we have such a great, amazing ability to create all these other environments for leisure time? Uh, you see a computer, a desk, and um, sometimes these things don't work. And there's a certain emotional framework to the extent you can express yourself. And then sometimes uh, when you're angry, frustrated, you have the choice. What am I going to do? Am I going to obey and not break anything and just going to repress my emotions? Or am I just going to release them? <laughs> And what you also see is, uh, is how, how do people respond. There's a big taboo about expressing yourself like that in the office. In my leisure time, I really like to dance. I really like to go out with friends and, 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 and yeah, let my emotions go uh, while moving. And I was wondering, how come? Is, it, is there a relation between the fact that I really enjoy dancing and I really don't like being in the office? Uh, so I started to wonder, like, what is it that makes me happy when I'm dancing? Um, and actually, there is a relation. And there is a really strong relation between how we bodily uh, get activated when we feel certain emotions. Uh, at Aalto University in Finland, uh, they did a research on the, uh, how the body is activated when you feel certain emotions. They placed a heat camera in front of people, their, their bodies, and they showed them images. And they asked them, uh, where what, what do you feel? And with the heat camera, they detected where they, the body got activated. You see uh, the, red, the red and the yellow is, uh, is increase of, of heat and blue is decrease. And when you look, for example, at happiness, you see that the full body is activated. The full body is, 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 uh, is getting activated when you're happy. But when you compare that, for example, with depression, you see that the, the, the energy is taken away from the limbs and from the arms. Um, I was wondering, what, what do we actually do um, when we are in the office? What, what kind of activity do we have? We mainly use our brain and our fingers. And if you look then again at the map, you see that that mainly relates to contempt. So no wonder that after half a year of being in office, I felt, I felt contempt in regards to my, to my environment and to my job. Uh, knowing this, I wanted to know, but what are actually the movements and what are the things, um, what, what, what kind of movements re, uh, generate certain emotions? And for doing that, I started to, uh, to study the discipline of dance. I asked Escapino Blame Rotterdam, can I infiltrate? Can I observe your dancers? Can I be part of your lessons? Can I understand your profession? Like, can I understand uh, how dancers relate uh, their movements with expression? So I went to uh, Scopino Ballet, and with that question in mind, I started to, uh, to observe their lessons and observe the dancers. And uh, when I was going there, I figured out there are relations. And there are ways uh, that the people... Um, I did see relations between how people moved and how they, uh, how they generated emotions. So here you see, uh, <laughs> I also really, I really felt like, like a fool almost because they're really professional dancers and I, didn't, I, I wasn't having, having the ability to do any dancing, but they still embraced me and I thought, okay, I'm gonna teach you how to, how to do ballet. <laughs> but um, yeah, when I, was, uh, when I was joining their lessons and observing them, I figured out that there, there were some movements they made that correlated with certain emotions. 
And uh, one of them was, uh, for example, rotation. When you, I still cannot kind of make a pure, uh, make proper rotation <laughs> movement. But when you rotate, you saw that people their response was very much related to joy and uh, to excitement. And also when they were accelerating, when they were going going up, you saw that that it also had a positive relation with their emotional expression. Uh, another one that was interesting was when we were doing choreographies. They mainly had to do asymmetrical body movements, and you saw that their, their emotion was more related to focus and concentration. Uh, but in the end, when they finished the full choreography, you saw there was a lot of satisfaction, and they wanted to share that satisfaction with each other. And uh, so that also correlated with a positive output. Uh, one, one movement that, that really uh, was interesting was jumping, because when they were jumping, they first had some kind of angry face and a, a bit of uh, a very focused face. And they, they got up, and once they got down, you saw a lot of release and a lot of joy. And then uh, I was Edwin Fisser, the physiologist uh, asked Capinoble, am I weird or is there really a relation between how people respond in relation to movements? And he explained me the following. He explained me that the, 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 the amount of emotional expression you experience correlates a lot with force. So when you need a lot of force to release yourself from gravitation, for example, uh, the, the emotional response that generates related to that force is bigger. So for example, you can feel more angry or more happy. But um, when you, feel, when you, when you um, feel you receive energy from, for example, your environment, uh, it correlates a lot with the release of, of, of emotions. So basically, you can relate it with a roller coaster. When you're uh, in a roller coaster, uh, for me, the roller coaster is the, the best example of how, how the movements you make as a dancer and how it generates emotions are generated by, by a roller coaster. When you go up, you feel, you feel a lot of anger, but when you go down, you feel a lot of release, and then it throws you along the, the bend. So somehow having that, that metaphor in mind was, was a good medium for me to understand this uh, hypothesis. Uh, okay, now we kind of know that that movement relates to, uh, to happiness or to emotions in general, but how does our environment relate to happiness or to, to the state, to a positive state of mind? Uh, I went to the physiologist, and uh, Andor Vuve, he explained to me that actually in physiology, people really know that there is a relation to the environment and uh, emotions. They call it the enriched environment. The enriched environment is how we as people are evolved to understand our environment. Uh, we have bodies and a mind, and through our bodies we understand our environment. And we do that with four, uh, uh, four informational paths. And basically these four paths are written here. It's, uh, the first one is visual. It's how you see your environment, how you, uh, how you can imagine your environment. So, for example, you can relate to your environment with your imagination. The second one is motor. That's the information we receive from our muscles. Uh, so, for example, when I'm carrying uh, shopping bags, I feel the presence of the bag with the amount of force uh, or uh, power I need in my muscles to keep the bag up. Uh, also, balance is an example of motor and how your muscles communicate information to your brain. Another one is cognitive. Uh, when I'm walking on glass, for example, I know it's going to break. So I'm aware of uh, what that environment is going to do with me uh, when I'm going to walk on it. <coughs> so sensory is uh, also a very interesting one. It's um, how your skin communicates information to your brain. So when I'm feeling water with the rain, my, my skin uh, gives my, my brain information about the fact that there's water on my skin. But also temperature, uh, temperature relates to the skin, and uh, pain. Also, pain is something that we detect with our skin. And what this theory stated, what they researched, was that when our body is able to have these four elements of information in balance in our daily life, uh, the brain is giving pulses that it's good, that the environment is, is fulfilled. But when you look, for example, at the office environment, you can imagine that the two pulses of information we mainly use is visual with the screen and cognitive, but the things we know, the languages we use and when we use a computer. So some of the sensory motor are completely underused in our office environments. So uh, it's not an enriched environment. So then as a designer, um, I was wondering, how can I make uh, the office environment or our productive environment enriched? In what way can I, um, can I have achieve that goal? And then I was wondering, like, what do we actually do in our lives? Well, when, I'm, when we're going to sleep, uh, the next day I wake up, uh, I'm walking to the, to the kitchen, I'm going to have breakfast, and then uh, I'm going I'm to walk to my car, if I, if I would have one, <laughs> and I'm going to drive to my car, and then uh, I'm going 
uh, to enter my office. I'm going to have a chat, have a coffee with my colleagues. I'm going to sit behind a desk. I'm going for lunch, and then I'm going to work again. And maybe I'm going to a TED conference and sit and <laughs> see people having a presentation. And then I'll go home and have dinner again, and I'll go to sleep. So basically, our main activity we have nowadays is sitting. But how can I relate sitting to motor and somatosensory? How can I make sitting into a dynamic activity uh, that you can move with? And how can I relate it to the skin? So therefore, I want to make an ex exoskeleton chair that can follow the body and allows your body to move while you're having your, your uh, productive activities. Uh, for having a deeper understanding of how you can move in a chair, because obviously when I move in my chair a lot, it will generate a lot of friction, and I don't want people to, uh, to get irritated when they're sitting in it, I had to understand the skin and how the skin deforms. So at what, what parts of the body I can connect uh, the chair to the skin. So I uh, asked two friends of mine, Ludovica and Maria, to cover me in liquid clay. And uh, when the clay dried, uh, I, uh, uh, the, the clay was cracking. And on the part where it cracked the most, that, that's what you see in this drawing, um, the most lines were drawn. So basically on this drawing you see at what parts of the body the skin moves the most. And where it's less dense, these are parts that are interesting for me because these are parts where the skin deforms the least and where I can make uh, attachment to the skin. So, what, so this is kind of a scheme uh, that gave me an understanding how I could connect the chair to the, to the body. But then later, um, I also had to make the joints. And uh, for the joints, I had to understand what, does the angle, what kind of angles does the body make? Uh, what, what kind of shapes can it configure the body? So I asked uh, Josh Wolford, another friend of mine, uh, to wear this suit <laughs> and to dance in front of a camera that gave me a clear insight of all the different angles the body is capable of making. Uh, after this information, uh, I, I continued working on a prototype and tried to figure out how I could make an exoskeleton chair that you can sit in. But then along the way, I made a, a prototype that was very complex. It was a big mechanism and it could, it could basically move according to the body. Uh, and then I was wondering, okay, you have a chair and you're able to move with it. You can, ma you can, make, uh, yeah, you can make all the movements you want. And then what? Then you're still going to sit behind your desk, use your keyboard and your mouse, and you're, go you're not going to use the movements that the chair is capable of moving. So I thought I have to relate the activity uh, you do, you actually do, uh, with your body movements. So I have to functionalize the body movements through the chair. Uh, so then I asked a, a friend of mine, a Semi Sabic, if he wanted to jump in the, pro in the project. He's a programmer. And he started to make sensors and a software program that could translate these movements into I'll how you use your computer. And, in the right and this uh, is some kind of future scenario. Right there. What do you think? Of what the office can look like when uh, people work there with their body movements. <laughs> Movies made by uh, Ziggy, or another friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, so maybe, uh, if in the future uh, we can have an office that you can move with while working, I will uh, become an architect again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>